All right, welcome y'all. Good to be here and see you guys here for our third week of our John series. Uh, throughout scripture, we see that names have significance. They hold a lot of value. God even changes some of the people's names that we find throughout the Old and the New Testament. Does anybody know some of the name changes that happen in the Bible? Yes, read. Saul went to Paul. Yeah, Saul went to Paul. Any others? Sarai becomes Sarah. Abram becomes... Abraham, yeah, those are some pretty easy ones. What about um, uh, one other one that I wanted to go over? Uh, it's really not that important, but now, oh, Simon. Simon Peter. Simon Peter, there we go. All right, good, yeah. One last one. Um, often when God changes these names, it gives us a glimpse into what's going to happen for them. Maybe some of their meaning or purpose or looking into the future for them, some of their direction. How many of you have you ever thought about, like, do you like your name? Have you guys thought about that before? Who really likes their name? Anyone, like, really bummed out by their name? Some people? Okay. I can remember when I was in, like, third grade in elementary school, there were, like, six or seven other Lindsay's. Like I felt so not special, so unoriginal, because there were all these Lindsay's all in my third grade class. But the ironic thing is we don't get to choose our names. Like we don't actually get to pick those. Somebody else picks those for us. Our parents choose our names for us. Often sometimes with different kind of meaning or value behind it, sometimes random. Uh, so when David and I were, uh, when we got pregnant the, the first time um, with our first son, uh, we really wanted a girl. Like we were so, both of us, both David and I, like for whatever reason, we were fixated on having a girl. We were so excited about that. And I remember going to, you get an ultrasound and the ultrasound technician, if you want to find out the gender, will tell you the gender um, of, your, of your baby. And I remember we were both there and we were like, we we're so excited. We had these names in mind for girls. And she said, you're having a boy. And we were both like, whoa. Okay, like felt guilty instantly that like we were almost like disappointed, like that just feels so wrong, but we just had been, for whatever reason, it's not like you have control over it or can plan this out, but we just had been thinking, kind of fixated on the fact that we have a girl. And I remember the ultrasound technician walked out of the room and then David turns to me and says, what do you think about the name Parker? I was like, huh, I like it. We hadn't talked about any boy names previously at this point. And I just, I really liked it. There's something special about that in that moment. And so we discussed other names, we brainstormed others, but we really just stuck with that one. We kept coming back to Parker. And then a few weeks later, we are getting together with our family. And I remember like telling my, my family on my side um, what we were gonna name our first child. And they were like, oh cool, how'd you come up with that? And I told them the story or whatever. And then my dad proceeds to say, well, that's weird. You know what? The street I grew up on in Michigan was named Parker Avenue. So here's Parker. This is, I think he's like two years old there. His birthday is the end of this month. So that was like right at two years ago. Um, so it was really cool that the name we chose, he grew up on Parker Avenue. So his great, great um, grandparents' house uh, is like right across the street. You can see it, their house from that sign. Um, so then we, we have another son named Preston, and we kind of got fixated for whatever reason on having two P's in our, in our family um, for, our, for our children. I don't really know why, but we just wanted to go that route. Um, but there's not too many options when you do that, and so we came up with Preston. And then it was so cool, on, my, on David's side, the house that his mom grew up on was Preston Street. Just kidding, that's not true at all. <laughs> Yeah, but this is true, and this is where my, my dad grew up and lived across the street. But no, Preston, it, we just kind of liked the name. And some of you might have kind of stories like that. You're like, the parents are like, eh, I just chose the name. And you're like, thanks, I don't feel special at all. Um, I'm pretty sure Lindsay was like that, but that's okay. I've, I've grown to like my name now. Uh, but when it comes to God, there's different names that we often use to identify God. I think about it sometimes when we go to God in prayer and we use different names to interact with God. What are some of those names that you all use when you call on God? Jesus, Father, any others? Lord, Dad, yeah, Dad or Daddy, Abba, Father. Some others, Savior, King, Redeemer, Shh. There's a lot of different names that we sometimes use to identify God, and it often gives us a clue on how we relate to God as well. I want to turn to Exodus in the Old Testament when God gave Moses the job of delivering the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. And then Moses decides to ask 
for God's name. It kind of this scripture passage kind of reminds me of that moment when you meet somebody and then you meet them again and then you see them again, you're like, oh shoot, I totally should know their name, but I've forgotten it and it's too late now, like too much time has passed that so I can't ask them that before. Has that happened to anybody else? And I literally was at a birthday party for Parker the other day and this girl was like, hey, and I was like, hey, I guess we should know each other because you're acting like we do, but I really have no idea who she was. Left the party, still don't know. Um, but it, it was nice that at some point in time, maybe we had met. All right, so looking at Exodus 3, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I believe her, but I don't know. Uh, looking at Exodus 3, verses 13 to 14. But Moses said to God, If I now come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you. They are going to ask me, what's this God's name? What am I supposed to say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. So they say to the Israelites, so then say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. So Moses had fled years earlier. He was living in another land and God spoke to him. And we remember this burning bush scene and told him to, he's going to take on the most powerful nation in the world. And Moses didn't want this job. Has anybody ever given you a task before, given you responsibility and you're like, I don't want to do that. Like, I don't feel qualified. I, I'm not sure why is, why is somebody asking me to do that? Why is God calling on me to do that? So that's Moses here. And Moses is like, I think I should at least know the person's name of who's kind of hired me, who's taken me on. And God said, I am who I am. Tell the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. It's kind of a strange answer, right? The actual name in Hebrew is written out without the vowels and can be translated as either I am who I am or just I am. In English, it comes out to Y-H-W-H and pronounced Yahweh. But the Israelite people in the ancient Jewish culture, they, the descendants often thought it was just too powerful and too great of a name to even say out loud, and they would substitute it often with other names like Lord or Adonai. So then we move to the New Testament, where God comes in human form, in the person of Jesus. And we heard from Derek about that in week one of our series, in the prologue of John, where Jesus comes, God in the flesh. And so now we turn to John chapter 8, and Jesus is talking to some religious leaders here about Abraham, another important person from the Old Testament, and says, Very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. So this infuriated the religious leaders. They're like really upset at this point, kind of mind blown that this guy Jesus is claiming to be God. He calls himself the I am that we just heard about in the New Testament where God interacted with Moses. So we're reminded throughout the Gospel of John that not only did Jesus come as a person, but that Jesus is claiming divinity, meaning Jesus is claiming to also be God while fully man. And there's seven more examples throughout the Gospel of John where Jesus uses this statement and refers to himself as I am, each time revealing something about who Jesus is and what a relationship with Jesus looks like. I'm going to look kind of more closely at just one of those during our teaching tonight, and there's six others that you'll get to explore in your small group time later. So do you remember what did Derek talk about last week? Anybody? John is right. What from the Gospel of John? What did Jesus do? Turn water into wine. Yeah, so... And the, at the wedding, very good. Wedding, yeah, okay. So the miracles that Jesus performs, many miraculous signs throughout the Gospel of John and others. And so there's a miracle story where Jesus takes just a few loaves, a few fish, and feeds thousands of people. He multiplies the food and feeds many. So that's where we have a miracle story, and we'll pick up in our scripture passage tonight. And Katie Stamper is going to come and read some scripture for us. Katie, if you want to come on up. Here you go, Katie. So this is in the Gospel of John, chapter 6. She's going to start in verse 26 down here, Katie, okay. and use the mic. Um, and then if you want to stand over just a little bit, Katie. Everybody see Katie? Katie's going to be up here for a little while. Katie, you can go ahead and get started, and then I'll stop you in just a minute. The bread of life. <laughs> Jesus replied, 
I assure you that you are looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate all the food you wanted. Don't work for the food that doesn't last, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the human one will give you. God the Father has confirmed him and his agent to give life. Okay, pause, Katie, and then we'll pick up in a minute. So what do you think that he means when Jesus says, don't work for the food that doesn't last? Like, that's kind of confusing. Don't work? Like, don't we have to work to get food? Isn't work important? Aren't jobs important? Don't we often work so that... Don't worry about it. Don't we often work so that we can have money, so we can buy the things that we need, like food, shelter, clothing? Jesus, I don't think, is saying that work is bad. Jesus isn't saying that money is bad. We need that to buy things like food that Jesus is talking about here. But what do we want most in life? I think that's what Jesus is getting at. What do we spend most of our time doing? Netflix? Yep, that's, no, that's a, that's a very valuable answer there. Uh, other things that I think we, we kind of ascribe to and spend our time doing is for the temporary high of success so that we can be seen as something great or achievement in our grades so that we can make our parents proud or happy or put us on that right path for success with college or sometimes working for, for popularity so that people can like us. I know I'm guilty of all of these things, even Netflix included, um, and these things aren't bad by themselves. Those aren't bad things to uh, strive for. But Jesus instead says in this passage, work for the food that endures for eternal life. Jesus has the power to sustain us. Jesus has the power to fill us and give our lives meaning and purpose. You can read the next verse. Okay. They asked, what must we do in order to accomplish what God requires? Okay, what did, what did Jesus say here? What, what question? Read it again, Katie. Wait, okay. <laughs> what must we do in order to accomplish what God requires? They're asking, the people ask, what must we do? I think it's really interesting. They're asking like, what can I do? What's, what's something like an action verb? That's the kind of response we're looking for. Read the next verse. Jesus replied, this is what God requires, that you believe in him whom God sent. So what was Jesus' answer to their question? Yeah, it's a belief in him. So they wanted something, I think, kind of simple, like do this one thing, be nice to this one person, help just this one person, give money to, to a specific charity. And while I fully believe that a relationship with Christ calls us to action, it calls us to do things with our faith, but here Jesus is reminding us that it's so important to believe in the one whom God sent. He's saying I must first believe in Jesus, and I think that has a lot to do with trusting in him. And often, that's even harder. All right, you can keep going. It's right in the page. They asked, what miraculous sign will you do that we can see and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, just as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Okay, pause. As if it wasn't enough that Jesus has already performed these miracles. He's already fed thousands of people. And they're like, just one more, Jesus. Like, what else are you going to show us? What else can you, like, pull out of your bag of tricks? Is kind of what the people's response is here. They're wondering, what else can you do? We want more. And then they recall from history what God had done for the people, but they refer back to Moses when they were wandering in the desert and God provided a very special and specific kind of food. Does anybody know what it was called? Manna. Manna, yeah. So God provided for them in the Old Testament and they're recalling this strange bread, this manna. You can pick back up. Jesus told them, I assure you, it wasn't Moses who gave the bread from heaven to you, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said, Sir, give us this bread all the time. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I told you that you have seen me and still don't believe. Everyone whom the Father gives to me will come to me, and I won't send anyone away who comes to me. I have come down from heaven and... I've come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the one who sent me, and that I won't lose anything he has given to me, but I will raise it up to the, at the last day. This is my Father's will, that all who see the Son and believe in him will have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. 
Awesome, Katie. Thank you so much. I know there's a big chunk of it there at the end. Thanks for reading. Thanks for hanging in there. A lot of scripture there at the end. So Jesus said that like he, like the manna, had come from heaven. But he wasn't announcing like he was going to start like a catering business or start providing food all the time. Food such as bread, though, is necessary for life, but its effects are temporary. Have y'all ever gone into the pantry in your house looking for the loaf of bread, like you're going to make a sandwich and then there's mold on it? You like have gotten everything ready and you go in and there's mold on it and like that's just disgusting. It's the worst. But it's bread. It's temporary. It doesn't last forever. But the bread that will sustain you, the bread that will help you and won't help you be hungry again is the kind that Jesus is talking about here. I want you to think about like the best meal or your most favorite food that you've ever had. For me, I think about the first thing I thought of when I was thinking about this question. Shh was from Fresh Market, just next door um, to the church here. There's this cake, it's like five layer. It's raspberry almond. I love almond flavoring and desserts. I know that might not appeal to you, to you all, but like it's, to me, it's amazing. I've had it for my birthday a couple different times. Mom's gotten it for me. Birthday's coming up, I hope it happens again. But even the next day, like you're not still necessarily thinking about it. Maybe the next day. And then if I've got leftover cake, I'm still eating it. But like a week later, you've forgotten that best meal isn't quite the same anymore. So how many things in life do we treat like that for ourselves? As I asked earlier, I wonder what you're filling yourself with that's temporary. What are you relying on to give your life meaning and purpose? Our achievement, our grades, our status, our role on a specific team or group. Could it be social media, how many likes we have, how many followers we have, or the people we hang out with, or specific relationships? Jesus sustains us forever by bringing us to a relationship with God and one that's eternal. <clears throat> so the choice is ours to choose things of this world that are temporary to give us meaning and purpose or to choose the bread of life. The band's going to come up and close us out in just a final song. And I invite you guys to go ahead and stand. And I want you to close your eyes. Shh. I know it's so tempting. Talk to our neighbors. I want you guys to close your eyes. We're going to close out with a song called Your Great Name. And I encourage you to listen to the lyrics and remember the power in God's name that we've talked about tonight. The Israelites thought God's name, the great I am, was so sacred and great that they couldn't even pronounce it. Then in the person of Jesus, God came in human form and we further get to know who God is and we can better understand God when we look at these I am sayings of Jesus. So as we sing this final song, I want you to reflect on whether or not you rely on Jesus to be the bread of life. Is Jesus where you find your fulfillment?